Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to Zensar Q1 FY22 conference call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchtone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Amit Chandra from HDFC Securities. Thank you and over to you, sir. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, operator. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, on behalf of HDFC Securities, let me welcome you all to the Zensar Quarter 1 FI22 earnings call. Uh, we have with us Mr. Ajay Bhutturiya, CEO and MD, Mr. You know, Navneet Khandelwal, CFO, and the other senior management team members. So without further delay, I would like to hand over the call to Mr. Ajay Bhutturiya to give us an introduction of the rest of the management team and an update on the Quarter 1 FI22 performance. Following up, which uh, you know, we will open up for the question and answer session. Thank you and over to you, sir. Uh, thank you, Amit. Uh, hello and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today to discuss Zensar's financial results for the first quarter of fiscal year 2022. On this call with me are a few others from the Zensar leadership team. We have Namneet Khandelwal, our Chief Financial Officer, Vivek Ranjan, our Chief Human Relations Officer, Pramila Kalibe, our Chief Operating Officer, Harjot Atri, Global Head of High Tech Manufacturing and Digital Financial Services, Digital Foundation Services, I apologize. Nachiketa Mitra, our Global Head of Banking, Financial Services and Insurance. Shishendu Dev, Global Finance Controller. And Arjun Varthi, Head of Corporate Development. First and foremost, I hope that you and your families are keeping safe. Our thoughts are with everyone during the continued COVID crisis. I hope and believe that better days are ahead of all of us. As the second wave of COVID hit India, we worked to provide extensive support to our associates and their family members. Our emergency response team, which includes the top leadership of the firm, closely monitored the situation, worked to secure medical infrastructure, and oversaw an extensive multi-location vaccination campaign. We created a mobile-enabled tracking platform to help coordinate procurement and usage of oxygen concentrators, ambulances, hospital beds, and vaccine doses to ensure resource availability and utilization in the best possible manner. We also created a network to facilitate plasma donations from our recovered associates. And as we speak, over 65% of our associates in India are, are vaccinated with at least one dose. Before I take you through the Q1 performance, I'm pleased to highlight our acquisition of M3BI, which strengthens our capabilities in advanced engineering, data engineering, analytics, and AI ML services. We are excited and look forward to integrating M3BI into Zensar. Now, moving on to our Q1 FY22 performance, we started FY22 on a positive note. Revenue for Q1 FY22 stood at 127.2 million US dollars, which represents a sequential quarter-on-quarter -quarter growth of 5.8%. This Q1 Q growth is the highest organic growth for Zensar in the last six years. Our growth in Q1 FY22 was led by an increase in revenue in multiple areas. We registered growth across all geographies with South Africa region registering 9.5% sequential Q on Q growth and the US region showing 6.7% sequential Q on Q growth. While our, while our European region saw a muted sequential growth of 0.1%, we are seeing significant traction in experience-led engineering, contributing to multiple new client additions in this geography, which should reflect in results in the coming quarters. Our high-tech manufacturing vertical registered 9.2% sequential quarter-on-quarter -quarter growth, indicating a steady recovery by our high-tech clients, and we are confident that this momentum will continue. Our banking business has shown a sequential growth of 5.2% quarter-on-quarter, indicating that our investments in this vertical are paying off. 
Insurance vertical has registered a dip of 2.2 quarter on quarter sequentially due to a few client specific issues and project ramp downs. We will remain committed to investing in this vertical in order to bolster growth. Consumer services remain stable with sequential quarter on quarter growth of 0.6% and a year on year growth of 19.2%. We are seeing an uptick in revenue in both our service line digital application services, which has shown 6.4% sequential growth quarter on quarter and digital foundation services, which has posted 2.3% sequential quarter on quarter growth. This positive demand indicates a stabilization in clients that were impacted by the pandemic. I'd like to reiterate that our strategy launched last quarter has a clear objective of achieving sustainable growth over the next three to seven quarters. Gross margin stood at 34.8% versus 34.9% in the last quarter. EBITDA margin for Q1 FY22 was 18.5%, a sequential decline quarter on quarter by 142 basis points. The margin decline was primarily due to increased cost of delivery and increased OPEX investments. PAT margin for the quarter stood at 10.8% compared to 10.3% last quarter. We reached a new milestone in our net cash position, which stands at $183.2 million. This strong war chest allows us to continue investing into our strategic growth opportunity areas to drive growth. Order booking for the quarter was at $96.7 million TCV, which includes both renewals and new business. We have also scaled an existing customer into the $20 plus million category bringing the total number of clients in this category to three. Our new company strategy has received, has received a positive response from our clients. We see increased traction and multiple wins in experience services and advanced engineering services areas. I'm confident that with us, our new SGOs, we will continue to deliver expertise and transformation to our clients. Zenthar's headcount crossed 9.5 mark and stood at 9512 for Q1 FY22. We announced salary hikes for our associates effective July 1st, 2021, which is our second hike in the calendar year. We continue to invest in our internal talent and on onboarding fresh talent. Before handing over to Namit for a detailed walkthrough of the Q1 FY22 financials, I would like to provide a brief update on the strategy refresh that we announced last quarter. We are sharpening our go-to-market by refocusing and realigning company resources along five strategic growth areas, experience services, advanced engineering services, data engineering and analytics, application services, and foundation services. We conducted a massive exercise to roll out detailed playbooks that enable our associates to approach the market with a crystallized set of services and a strong set of value propositions for our clients. We remain focused on investing in our talent engine, adding niche talent to align with our strategic priority areas, along with massive upskilling and reskilling initiatives. We have expanded our hunting teams to drive growth in existing strategic and into new accounts. Over the coming quarters, as we keep refining and implementing our strategy, we will keep you updated of our progress. With that, I now invite Namit Khandelwal, our Chief Financial Officer, to update you on the quarter's key financial data and open the floor for questions. Yeah, thank you, Ajay. Good day, everyone. Welcome to this call. In addition to Ajay talking about the business, I will talk you through some of the details on financials. In the first quarter of FY22, we have reported revenue at Rs. 9368 million, which reflects a Q&Q sequential growth by 6.8% and a year-on-year -year decline by 1.2% in rupee terms. In US dollar terms, the reported revenue is 127.2 million reflecting growth of 5.8% sequentially. 
and 1.6 percentage annually in constant currency terms uh, for the quarter growth of 4.8 percent sequentially and a decline of 3.1 percentage annually the us dollar realization the uh, during the quarter has been 73.7 per dollar against rupees 72.9 in the previous quarter the year before in the same quarter it was rupees 75.8 our gross margin declined marginally to 34.8 percentage as against 34.9 percentage in the previous quarter pat percentage improved to 10.8 percentage versus 10.3 percentage in the previous quarter this shows a sequential growth of 10.9 percentage in absolute terms the effective tax rate has increased to 26.4 percentage as against 25.3 percentage in the previous quarter for the quarter ended june 30 2021 bill dso has increased as compared with the previous quarter and stood at 55 days against 51 days while dso including unbilled increased by 3 days to 80 days as against 77 days in the previous quarter on a year on year basis dso including unbilled increased by 7 days from 73 days to 80 days cash and cash equivalents including investments in mutual funds net of borrowings increased from 166.3 million in the previous quarter to dollar 183.2 million in the quarter ended june 30 2021 reflecting a net increase of 16.7 million dollars the total amount of outstanding hedges as of june 30 2021 was equivalent to us dollar 136.1 million against dollar 122.3 million in the previous quarter on may 15 2021 we entered into a definitive agreement to acquire m3bi a scottsdale arizona based data engineering and digital engineering firm the acquisition has been completed in the month of july with this n3bi revenues will be included in our performance from q2 onwards with that i come to the end of my presentation and open the house for questions and answers thank you very much we will now begin the question and answer session anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star in 1 on the touch tone telephone If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Manik Taneja from JM Financial Services. Please go ahead. I thank you for the opportunity. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, is this better now? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Congratulations on uh, the sequential rebound in terms of business. Ajay, I was wanted to understand that this current quarter we've seen the rebound largely led by the high tech vertical. Uh, just wanted to get some sense as to when do we start seeing this growth getting much more broad based. And the second question was related to the increase in onshore mix during the current quarter. any sense on what's driving that and how should we be thinking about this aspect going forward thank you sure thanks manik uh, and good morning so manik uh, yeah let me go one question at a time so we saw growth across multiple verticals and geographies right our uh, high tech business grew uh, 30.5% uh, banking grew 5.2% uh consumer services business you know which has been steadily growing you know it's it's it was one of the worst affected uh, of the industry verticals for us during the pandemic it has been steadily growing and stabilizing uh, it grew just about half a point but it's on a good wicket uh in terms of our geographies uh, uh us grew by 6.7% uh, quarter on quarter uh south africa grew 9.5% quarter on quarter and europe while it was marginally higher at uh, you know just 0.1% but what we have seen is that uh, you know it did face some headwinds in terms of uh, from a revenue perspective in terms of completed projects but we saw a flurry of new wins 
uh, led by the whole experience led engineering playbooks that we have driven uh, you know with full proof and zens are coming together and that will generate momentum over the course of next 2 to 3 quarters so we have, we have seen growth across multiple uh, verticals and across uh, geographies so that is uh, uh, manik uh, the, the first uh, part of your question now in terms of uh, you know increase in on site mix a uh, couple of things to call out there so we saw a bunch of deal wins during the quarter and as we execute you know the beginning of those deals typically start with uh, a sizable on site activity so that is one factor that has increased the on site uh, mix in this quarter and the other thing is we saw an uptick in terms of our near shore delivery uh, be it us uh, you know or other geographies and these two factors have contributed to the on site mix uh, increase thank you for that explanation uh, i also had a follow up question late for navneet so last quarter we had seen certain one offs in the gna expenses related to the outgoing ceo uh, so one would have expected the gna expenses to come off so what's driving the gna expenses uh, uh, to be stable at the current levels yeah uh, manik while there were certain one off uh, hits there were certain one off credits also as a result to that which were knocking off and as we are working towards investing into our uh, new strategy some element of uh, hiring which happens gets reflected from an accounting perspective into gnda uh, as opposed to snm so that's where uh, the gnda is stabilized another element i want to call out is last quarter we also had uh, a net write back in our provision for bad and doubtful debts uh, whereas this quarter there has been a marginal hit so that swing also has had some kind of an impact in the overall gnda okay okay thank you all the best for the future yeah thank you bye thank you the next question is from the line of sandeep agarwal from edelweiss please go ahead yeah good morning uh, to the management team and thanks for giving me an opportunity ajay i have one question with four sub parts and i hope you will be helping me with those clarification first of all ajay uh, since you joined and till now and this question i have asked you days back also are you seeing a change in your timeline which you are now dedicating towards business versus uh, filling up your leadership gap filling up your, or your capability gap filling up your geographic and client gap is there a change which means i want to know that uh, uh, is the progress on fixing those issues uh, broadly done or is is uh, done to some extent so that it releases a bandwidth for you to for marketing and sales and i don't mean to say that you know uh, you are not doing a balance act of doing all of them together you are definitely doing it but my intention is to understand how much bandwidth you have been able to release from those processes which will give me clarity that those processes have now stabilized so that is one part of my question uh, uh second part of my question is that you are in you are in a very very strict spot with you know almost 50% of your business coming in from uh from from high tech and manufacturing which is like you know one of the best segment expected to be one of the best segment given the scarcity of manpower in the european region and given the significant amount of uh, growth which is coming in this segment and moreover the massive demand supply gap which has been built in the consumer electronic side and all so uh, when, when do you see that you know that growth is to a super, very very bigger number i know what you have done well but i still believe there is some leadership gap uh, not may not be at top level but at some middle level which is restraining our growth in that segment so that is part uh, sub part two of my question uh you want me to tell the two other questions now or you will first answer this two uh yeah sandeep let me first uh, i've actually tried to make notes but let me start with the first two questions and then i'll wait for your other two questions so sandeep as you yourself pointed out right uh in my role i work on multiple different counters right i work on sales and marketing i work on delivery i work on strategy i work on operationalization of strategy i constantly work on making sure we have the best leadership 
uh, in Zensar, be it market leadership or be it engagement and delivery leadership. Uh, we did a massive strategy refresh, uh, you know, last quarter, and we have kicked off this uh, operationalization of strategy into uh, the first gear, and uh, we'll continue to uh, double down on that operationalization over the next few quarters. Now, it is not that the mix is going to drastically change, right? There's a bunch of things that we put in place. Uh, now, some of the, you know, just, just going one at a time, right? Uh, I did mention to you the last time we spoke is that uh, we came off a healthy EBITDA, a healthy cash position. We are going to expand activity. We are going to expand our uh, sales teams. We are going to expand the overall uh, go to market and we have done a reasonably good job during the quarter you know we've done some internal rotation we have a new head of high tech manufacturing arjot atri uh, we hired a new head of uh, consumer services for markets we also hired a new head of delivery for consumer services uh, we moved a few leaders off the firm around uh, and i feel very good about how the leadership team is shaping up now to attest to that, I'll actually start going into answering your second question. A testament to that is our high-tech business grew by 13.5% sequentially or quarter on quarter, right? And it was underpinned by multiple different uh, areas of growth. You know, outside of growth in existing accounts, we also closed a fair number of new logos that will assist us in keeping momentum going in this vertical. Uh, mind you, it's not just high tech that did well. Uh, over the last several quarters, we have invested in our banking business and our insurance business. Uh, banking uh, showed a 5.2% quarter on quarter growth. That book looks healthy. Uh, we've had a large number of uh, MSA closures. Uh, and uh, over the next two to three quarters, we feel confident of that business as well. In terms of geography, South Africa has done extremely well. That momentum will continue. UK saw a minor dip in terms of you know, project completions and closures, but then our experience-led engineering story there is resonating extremely well. And uh, you know, we see an uptick in business out there, both in terms of new logo closures as well as from within our existing accounts. So it gives me a good deal of confidence in terms of how we are shaping as a business. Now, like I mentioned, you know, the strategy has, we moved the strategy into the first gear, right? And as we did that, we have seen some early signs of success. And it shows that we are headed in the right direction. As we operationalize that strategy further, you know, our objective of driving predictable, sustainable growth, uh, we feel pretty good that, as I told you the last time, we are down a quarter. It is going to fire in the next three to seven quarters. I still maintain that. So, so thanks for that elaborate answer on top of two parts. The third question, Ajay, is that, you know, um, I will, uh, I, I want to know is how many large deal consultants, which I mean by is the external consultant who generally help in, you know, formulating and uh, sourcing the large deals. Are you already started engaging with those external consultants or you believe in the strategy that you will build your own large, large deal uh, team? Uh, what is the thought process on that side? Because we have seen most of the mid cap get associated with external large deal consultants and they give them that 25, 50 million, one or two deals, which help them to do op massive operating leverage. Because, you know, maybe COGS cost will go up because of supply side constraints, but, uh, but, but the way it is, uh, the, the pricing environment is the way the demand is chasing supply. I'm sure that, you know, uh, it will be a very big uh, opportunity for us. So have you thought on those lines? That is my third question. And my final question, and I apologize for the long question again, is that since uh, <coughs> I still believe that, you know, uh, our EBITDA margins are, are, are much below their optimum level if you compare same size businesses. And I understand that, you know, we have done acquisition, we are trying to assimilate it and we, uh, we have just started transitioning our, and getting into our strategy and all. But, but do you think that, you know, high-tech and manufacturing, although you highlighted there is an internal management, um, internal person who is now leading that, it is a great thing to happen. Uh, but do you think that that was the only gap in high-tech and manufacturing and below that there are no gaps? Because see, I am very, when I, when I speak to clients in the European market, particularly in that space, the feeling I get that there is, there is 
huge demand and there is no credible vendor or supplier today there is no supply of manpower no one who can commit that so is it that you know uh, if, if we if, 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 is there a scope where you know we can fill those gaps within the high tech and manufacturing and that can boost our growth much higher than what we are seeing today and i am not complaining about the current growth so what i'm trying to understand is that do can we you know reach 30 35% growth in high tech and manufacturing the way demand is if we have the right leadership team of below the top leadership and also the large bill consultants who can get us there we have a different perspective thanks and thanks and best, best of luck for your future process sure sandeep sandeep that was two long questions and i'll try to do justice with my answers so first of all sandeep is that traditionally and always within zensar we have and will continue to have large deal focus now there are two aspects to this as you yourself pointed out sandeep um the first is how we engage with uh, you know third party intermediaries and third party advisors and this is both from a perspective of large deal inflows as well in, as it, as it is in terms of how we shape these deals now we traditionally had a lot of focus on this and we continue to have that focus we will not diminish that focus that is one second thing is that in order to meet this across the service lines we have internal engine to support uh, solutions in these large deals and we are not going to dilute those engines right if anything we will further enhance and strengthen those right uh, that is what i can share with you right now is our large deals are an area of focus for us absolutely are we working with third party advisors third party intermediaries absolutely do we have internal champions and internal capability to manage and solution for these large large deals absolutely in fact we have a very very differentiated story is this whole story that we have around experience led in engineering and experience led infrastructure has resonated extremely well and it continues to uh, bite us well uh, both in small and large deals so that is one part uh, you know that's your first question sandeep your second question uh, i would like to answer differently see if you look at how demand is shaping up right overall and you would have heard this in commentary you know from overall in the industry is that it is a demand rich environment it is a demand rich environment and that demand pervades across industry verticals right even verticals such as retail which were so badly impacted due to pandemic as we come out of the pandemic and as people start investing in increased digitalization and more aggressive digitalization right we have entered into an era where the demand environment is very positive and this is just high tech this is across verticals right now our view of that is that this demand is largely in certain capabilities and certain skills and in order to cater to that demand we have clearly called out is to two strategic growth opportunities right traditionally uh, because of uh, our investment in foolproof and indigo slate are two banners under which we deliver experience services we were strong in experience services we have bolstered that strength by adding two very clear strategic growth areas one is advanced engineering services through which we deliver complex engineering skills and through which we deliver cloud native full stack services that is an area where we see a lot of activity a lot of uptake and demand and by creating this sharp focus i think we are setting ourselves up to meet the market demand and that is the category in which there is going to be demand not just in high tech but also in other uh, industry verticals but to your specific point i by the way completely agree with you that high tech is a space where there is going to be a lot of demand now and it's not just advanced engineering services closely attached to advanced engineering services is data engineering analytics ai ml they kind of go hand in hand and these two are big big areas of thrust and investment for us sandeep i hope i was able to answer your questions yeah ajay yeah, thanks a lot for those telegraph answers and i will come back in queue i have a very simple and small question from navneet also but i will be in queue thank you sure sure thank you
The next question is from the line of Nitin Padmanabhan from Investec. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Good morning, everyone. Uh, had a couple of quick ones here. Uh, one is on high tech. Um, uh, considering there's been a reasonable recovery uh, with the top deck uh, within that vertical. Um, now, how do you see it going forward? Uh, you did mention a couple of deals uh, and things like that. Uh, do you see uh, what, uh, any context that you could give in terms of uh, uh, qualitative sense on uh, what, what those new entry points with new clients are? Um, the second thing was on the uh, retail vertical and any specific uh, pass-through revenues this quarter. Um, and finally, on margins, uh, just wanted your thoughts on how uh, the uh, salary increases could sort of impact margins next quarter and are there any offsets um, uh, for that uh, uh, impact? Uh, those were my three questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, hi, Nitin. Uh, Nitin, thanks. Uh, I will answer your first question and I'll uh, defer questions two and three to Navneet and I'll add as needed, Nitin. So Nitin, in terms of high tech, uh, uh, what we have seen is traction across board. So to give you a sense, as some of our largest relationships have stabilized and accelerated, right? And as I've mentioned, right, we are deeply focused on making sure that we deliver value to them and we constantly stay aligned uh, to their business strategy and to how they execute on their business, right? Uh, that has borne fruit, right? And as they have stabilized and they have accelerated their business, it has had a positive impact on us. Outside of that, uh, within the high-tech space, and also, you know, the question that Sandeep asked, we see a lot of activity in advanced engineering services. So that is one place where we've seen a lot of uptick and a lot of activity. Uh, but that's not the only place. We also saw a serious amount of work within our experience services category within high tech space. So our experience services business also witnessed a fairly sizable growth uh, within that space, right? So it has been across service lines and across the various clients that we have within our high tech business. So overall, we feel good about it. So this, of course, has been a a very, very fruitful quarter from high tech business. And, uh, you know, I feel quite positive about this business going forward, especially in line of uh, uh, the new leadership that we've brought in and in terms of what that leadership is doing to drive up business. And then for your, Nitin, for your second and third question, I would uh, request Navneet to chip. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Ajay. Yeah, Nitin, so in terms of uh, retail vertical, the, the numbers that you see are pure uh, services uh, num based numbers and it's uh, shown a modest growth of about 0.6 percentage sequentially. Uh, there has not been any pass through element uh, associated with that. Uh, in terms of the margins, uh, actually this quarter, if you'll see, uh, our uh, gross margin got impacted by 0.1 percent adverse. That's largely because we got uh, uh, positive on the exchange side, uh, which was to the extent of about 0.9 percentage. And uh, we've seen uh, supply side pressures uh, impacting our cost of delivery, uh, which uh, which has also, uh, which has been one of the hits which we took this quarter. And uh, the utilization also has dipped a bit. In terms of OPEX, our, uh, uh, our hg and has gone up. Uh, that's in line with the investments that uh, we had planned to do. Uh, and uh, that's that that's largely on track is what I would say. Uh, I would also want to iterate that uh, we have announced wage hikes effective first of July uh, across the board. So that is something which you will start seeing uh, as an impact uh, on a go forward basis as we continue to invest in our sales engine and the other strategic areas as a part of our operationalizing of strategy. In terms of operating levers, uh, we are working on multiple levers, including pyramid optimization, uh, uh, productivity improvement. Uh, we are uh, having a continuous focus on offshoring as an element. And we would look at uh, uh, every ways and means possible to how do we improve uh, profitability in uh, uh, specific accounts. So that, that in, uh, in nutshell summarizes 
uh, the overall margin perspective from our side. Sure. Uh, I just had two quick follow-ups, if I may. Uh, so one is, yeah, sure. uh, Navneet, if, if you could uh, quantify what could be the potential impact uh, on margin because of salary increases. Uh, and two, uh, Ajib, on uh, high-tech, uh, if I understand, there are very two dominant uh, clients within the high-tech, uh, both on the experience space and the application space. Uh, uh, apart from that, uh, so do you see the sort of traction within those clients sort of continuing in terms of momentum going forward? And, and two, uh, do you think there are other new clients that you spoke about which can actually you know, fill in for any project-based rundowns uh, that would happen uh, in, in case there were some uh, runoffs within that. Uh, so those were the two follow-ups. Thank you. Yeah, sure, Nitin. So what I'll do is I'll answer the first question. For the second question, I'll refer it to Harjot, uh, who is the head of that business. So in terms of uh, impact of salary increases, uh, we, we normally uh, don't uh, give any forward-looking guidance, uh, Nitin. Uh, but I would say that uh, uh, this salary increase will be typically uh, higher than what uh, we had uh, uh, given in the uh, in the January uh, earlier this uh, early this year. So that's how it will work out. Uh, over to you, Harjot, on the high tech questions. Uh, sure. Thanks, Navneet. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, so I think, uh, you know, what we have done with a new Zensar and a new strategy of Zensar, which is uh, SEO-centered, uh, we've also launched a new HTM strategy, you know, what we mean for our customers. Uh, so, yes, you know, we are cross-selling uh, new services into our existing accounts, uh, and we're acquiring new customers, new logos, uh, you know, with our new SEOs as well. And a lot of focus in the new service offerings are on the areas where our HTM customers will spend more money. So we are aligned to where they will spend, you know, post pandemic. Uh, and then it's largely, you know, new offerings around servitization uh, as a service model. You know, how do we help them, you know, do the reference architecture changes? Similarly, you know, with the traditional industrial manufacturers, you know, how do we enable a new reference architecture for connected operations? So, you know, our customers are seeing, uh, both our existing customers and our new customers are seeing uh, a new Zensar and a new HTM team, you know, which is very domain-led, uh, SEO-enabled, uh, and very much aligned to uh, where the spend would be over the next three to five years. So we feel very positive about, the, you know, the coming two quarters as well. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you so much and all the best. Thanks. Good evening. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sandeep Shah from Equity Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, just in this quarter, the growth rate at 4.8% CC. Uh, if I'm not wrong, close to 1.6% growth is driven through pass through. And also, there is a effort mix change from offshore to on-site. So, in that scenario, uh, is it wrong to say that the underlining volume growth is lower than 4.8 percent? And uh, second, uh, I think just wanted to understand in a new strategy, uh, what would be the go-to market? Uh, will it be verticalized or it would be horizontal-led as a whole? And I have a couple of more. Uh, will. Uh, Ask once these replies comes. Yeah. Right, uh, Namit, if you can take yeah, the Sandeep. first question. Oh. Yeah, Sandeep, and I'll I'll take the second question. Go yeah, ahead, yeah, Sandeep. Uh, yeah, so uh, Ajay briefly covered uh, earlier as well on the on-site mix uh, part of it. Uh, but uh, yes, there has been uh, some element of pass-through revenues. Uh, so to that extent. Uh, the sequential growth uh, in terms of uh, services volume per se in constant currency will be slightly lower than uh, the 4.8 percentage uh, that you are saying. Uh, so that's correct. But uh, we we see good momentum and volumes building up. One of the points which Ajay also highlighted is uh, this has been one of the highest growth that we have seen in the last six years. And this is coming after, I would say, around five 
uh, consecutive quarters of decline where the trajectory has changed and it has changed in a very meaningful way. Uh, I, I would let uh, Ajay tackle the second question now. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Tadeep. Uh, so, Sandeep, uh, look, the last time we spoke, uh, I did walk you through this big strategy refresh that we did, right? Traditionally, we had three by three by three, right? Which was three geographies, US, South Africa, UK, Europe, uh, three verticals, high-tech manufacturing, banking, financial services, insurance, and consumer services. And say two service lines, DAS and DFS, right? And a third one, budding experience services. But what we have done is that we have taken what was an 85% block of services uh, and we have put a very sharp structure uh, around these services in form of five SGOs, which is experience services, advanced engineering, data engineering, application and foundation. And to, uh, in, you know, to channelize these five SGOs into specific go-to-market, uh, uh, we have launched 21 services through playbooks, which are crystallized, well-defined services that we are taking to market. And under each playbook, we've got multiple levels of uh, content and material, as well as in terms of how we have structured ourselves to support these SGOs and playbooks, right? Uh, outside of this, as we operationalize the strategy, we have identified four pillars of operationalization. Uh, one is sales expansion. Two is what we do with talent. Three is uh, what we do with our strategic partnerships. And four is what we do with our m and Now, this quarter, we have started operationalizing this strategy. And, uh, and we have seen some, you know, early signs of success, and it shows that we are headed in the right direction, right? In the subsequent quarters, as we step up this operationalization, as we get into a higher gear of execution on this strategy, we will get to the objective that we have set for ourselves, which is to deliver predictable, sustainable growth, right? Right now, the way it looks like, the kind of market response that we have received, the positive response we have received from the clients, as we have articulated this message to them, and as we have uh, configured our services around these five SGOs and the 21 playbooks, uh, we feel that we will be able to meet the schedule that we published together with the, exercise, uh, with the strategy refresh, which is we are one quarter down, and in the next three to seven quarters, we will be able to hit the stride and the cadence of delivering predictable, sustainable growth. Sandeep, back to you. Uh, I think just to follow up, uh, so is it the sales organization is verticalized, uh, especially in the key market in the U.S., or it would be, again, each by uh, uh, SDUs as a whole? So how is the sales organization verticalized? Uh, we structured now? Yeah, yeah, Sandeep, good point. So we operate in a matrix, right? The core sales organization reports into the verticals, and the SGOs and the playbooks and the service lines are represented by strike force teams that matrix with the vertical sales teams in order to deliver our solutions and the value proposition to our clients. Okay, okay. And uh, this last few thing, uh, in terms of order intake, uh, this quarter has been $97 million, and the last quarter been $100 million. The 1Q to 3Q FY21 average was $175 million. So despite we are seeing the demand being hot, early signs of uh, uh, positiveness from the client on new strategy, uh, the order intake number has been declining as a whole. So any thought on the same? And uh, Navneet, just wanted to understand uh, your comment earlier about this year's EBITDA margin to remain at a high team. Is it still valid or you have changed your goalpost? So, uh, so Sandeep, I'll take a go first and then I'll request Navneet to add. So Sandeep, uh, what we have done in course of especially the last three quarters and we started this journey actually even prior is the is to work on how we report our metrics 
internally we have become much much more stringent in terms of how we report our numbers how we compute the numbers how we report the numbers we have become much more conservative right uh, we have heard from the community we have heard from you folks uh, we have also looked at uh, you know how we used to uh, report raw numbers versus qualified numbers as we go forth we will retain this stringent uh, set of steps that we have taken in terms of how we uh, how we uh, report these numbers, and the fact that we will be conservative on these going forward. Namneet, uh, do you want to add and and also take the second question? Yeah, sure. Actually, uh, there is a, a good amount of uh, logos that we have opened during the current quarter, and uh, as uh, we start. Uh, fulfilling them uh, and we are able to staff and start delivering revenues to them those will also start reflecting in the order booking so to a certain extent uh, the the numbers that you see on order booking is not really reflective of how we are uh, seeing the uh, the demand and fulfillment situation to pan out and resultant uh, impact of it in the top line uh, so you should look at this uh, over a period of time how does it work and uh, you should be able to correlate it much better go forward uh, is how uh, we see the order booking scenario will be uh, in terms of uh, the margin question uh, see we uh, along with the strategy we 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 had picked up and we talked about uh, our, our margins where see we don't give any immediate quarter guidances but we have said that uh, over the uh, over the mid to long term as the strategy starts uh, uh, working out, uh, getting to high teens level and maintaining that is something which uh, remains as an integral part of our strategy. So we are committed to that. Uh, however, as you start investing, okay, there will always be a time frame when initially as the investments uh, go in, uh, uh, while the, the revenue outcome takes uh, delivered over a lakh uh, on the investments, you could always see some uh, declines or, or some uh, shifts which happen in the margins in the interim. But uh, from a medium to long term perspective, we are, we are really focused uh, on what we have talked of and all our endeavors will be towards that. Uh, and, uh, you know, what I would do is uh, I would also invite uh, Pramila to just talk about a few of uh, what I would say the, the operational measures and rigor that we are putting in, uh, which should give us a leverage uh, in the times to come from an operating perspective. Uh, Pramila, you would want to add? Yeah, thank you, uh, Navneet. i just add to what Navneet talked about. So our focus on cost optimization continues, and two significant uh, tracks that we are uh, driving in a very accelerated way is the whole pyramid optimization. Uh, in that, uh, towards this, we are now creating a very, very strong internal talent marketplace that is reskilling and upskilling our internal talent in the big bet technologies that Ajay called out, whether it is advanced engineering, data engineering, AI, ML, our enterprise SaaS uh, uh, area. So we are upskilling our entire team uh, and also we significantly upped our pressure intake over the last few quarters and we will continue to do that in the year ahead. And our entire pressure program training has been focused on from day one, we want our pressures to be ready in these new areas. We are crunching the pressure time to deliverability. Uh, these two uh, will significantly help us increase our internal fulfillment as we respond to the increased demand in the market. Uh, this we believe, like Navneet called out, in the medium to long term, it will help us uh, mitigate some of the impact we will see in the margin on account of the wage hikes. And of course, the continued focus on automation, on uh, offshoring, these have been a focus areas. They will continue to be so. Uh, in the what is going forward as well. Okay, thank you. All the best. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Amit Chandra from STSC Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so my question is related to the sales and marketing investments. So have you filled all the gaps uh, uh, there or is there some areas where we need to you know, make further investments? 
also if you can you know elaborate what changes have been made in terms of the key hiring changes in the in the you know in the new structure and how the sales process the the incentive structure has changed and uh, you know uh, uh, like when do we see the large deals coming in so this is the first question and the uh, second question is on the insurance vertical so if you can elaborate uh, you know what is actually leading to this softness in this vertical and is it is it client specific or are we seeing you know this business in in the decision making here so and uh, like when do we see stability in this vertical any any like more color will be helpful thank you yeah so a bit uh, hi again and i'll take the first question and i'll ask tachi to pick up the second question uh, nachi keta mitra who heads banking financial services okay. insurance for us yeah so amit uh, the first question is that we have uh, we have uh, expanded the sales team as well as the engagement leadership team so we have expanded over the quarter both the go to market teams as well as the engagement team now this expansion has been not just in the vertical but also in the geographies and very importantly also in the strategic growth opportunity areas that i alluded to in, uh, just a little while back so it is across board now as we speak uh, you know so we have done we have been uh, you know done that over the last quarter or so and as we look into the next uh two three quarters we will continue to hire people into vertical and sgo sales uh, and engagement teams uh, although as we fulfill these positions the pace of that hiring will reduce so that's uh, amit is first question uh in terms of uh, you know deal flow uh, we take a very holistic view amit you know the way we go after the market is both large deals as well as what we do with uh, looking at our client areas of opportunity as well as problem statements uh, in terms of what we do with them proactively and third thing is uh, you know uh, in this highly demand rich environment a uh, fulfill the demand that is steadily coming you know from the clients to service providers such as us right so it is all the three vectors not just the large deals right so we are focused on all of these three vectors uh, so that's the first question and for the second question in terms of uh, you know what we are doing with the insurance business i would hand over to nachi thank you thank you ajay are, are you able to hear me okay yeah sure um thank you amit for the question uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, talk about our insurance practice i just want to um, uh, reiterate that as uh, navneet had uh, mentioned in his uh, statement that uh, um, you know there are certain client specific projects um, which are um, you know which came to an end and then another client got acquired by a larger organization so some projects went on hold so a couple of client specific issues um, that caused uh, a little bit of blip however we are doing as a response to that is we are broadening our uh play field right so we are um we used to be very very focused on property and casualty segment within united states so we are um you know expanding that market we are going after the larger clients who um are in the property and casualty segment but also we are going after life and benefits we are going after insurance insurance brokerage business um so that's that's number one in terms of the you know the way we are approaching the market uh, we are really focused on solution led consulting led delivery right and sales so deep uh, commitment towards uh, building up domain capability uh, we are reinforcing our partnership with guideware but we are also looking at other uh, platforms um, like duck creek uh, right now as we speak we are we are training our workforce on duck creek and because there are opportunities in the market that we want to kind of um, tap into um third thing is um, the way we are uh, looking at um, you know the sales process itself we are um, we are uh, tweaking it a little bit right uh, we are uh, you know we we are uh, doing hunting in packs so it's a client partner solution team as well as the hunters together going and with the with the prospects so the the conversion rates uh, we are seeing significant increase and then of course um, 
the partnership. So um, as I mentioned, um, you know, there are a lot of insure tech um, organizations that, uh, that, have, uh, that are, uh, you know, offering uh, tremendous niche solutions. And, and we are trying to partner with them as well so that we are relevant for the future with our uh, uh, clientele, insurance clientele. I would uh, take a pause and see if you have any, you know, clarification to what I just said. No, no, sir, it was helpful and, uh, you know, thank you and like best of luck for the future. Thanks, sir. Thank you, Amit. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sandeep Agarwal from Edelweiss. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks for taking my taking in the queue again. So I have uh, two questions. One is from Navneet first to start with. So Navneet, if you see, uh, you have one of the highest gap in the industry between EBITDA margins and EBIT. And if you see this pandemic, uh, this is actually against this gap and structurally should reduce this gap significantly, which means that, you know, you will, even if you grow your revenue at 0% for next, for next two years, which is impossible to achieve in my view, then also your earnings growth will, 15% earnings growth should only come from this gap getting reduced uh, because of the nature of the pandemic and the impact of it uh, on, that, on, the, on the lease, on the depreciation part of it. So, so I'm just trying to understand why, you know, that confidence is not showing up when you are talking about margins, so number one. Number two, uh, our question, second question is to Ajay and Navneet both. You have already spoken about the strategy, hiring, transitioning, and all that. Can you uh, please give us some uh, uh, highlight that, you know, the, the new leadership which you are hiring or the senior leaders you are hiring, what is your approach to hire them? Are you giving them a, a bigger bigger uh, upfront fixed salary or bigger commission uh, structure or you are giving them a huge ESOP which is largely back-ended because uh, giving huge fixed pay and huge variable pay uh, is a temporary solution to the demand supply mismatch. But I think a back-ended huge option is something which creates the value. So what is your approach towards that? If you can disclose it, uh, otherwise I'm fine with that. And finally, you know, in the worst of the pandemic situation, the large companies which have, you know, 20, 25 billion billion of revenue, they also just paused for one quarter before, you know, they gave some kind of guidance. And, and I'm not talking about quantitative guidance, but some benchmarking that we will be doing an industry growth or around that or will the second quartile, first quartile, top quartile, something. What stops you when you already are in six to seven months into the business, you have finished all your strategy and everything, and you already are talking about so much of traction in all the pieces of business. What stops you from giving some kind of qualitative guidance rather than quantitative? I am not at all pressing you to go against your policy of not giving guidance, but at least some quality that we will be in top quartile within the mid cap phase or the small cap phase or Probably industry growth or around that something if you can give them it will be very comfortable thanks a lot yeah, yeah Sandeep, uh, do you want to go first yeah 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 Sandeep. thanks for Sandeep. Then i'll let Navneet and then i'll add to answer you know questions two three i'll also pull in vivek so go ahead Navneet. yeah sandeep uh, i think your observation has been quite valid that uh you know between ebitda to ebit uh, there are a lot much more, there is a much more gap uh, in Zensar. But uh, uh, that's also because of the acquisitions that we have done in the past. A good chunk of that gap is on account of amortization of intangibles, which comes as a part of our PNL. Now, this amortization, based on the nature of intangible it is, it goes on for a period of about 5 to 10 years. So, as and when that amortization tapers off is when you will start seeing uh, tapering of that. Number two is as we scale up in terms of growth, and you are right, we will probably not be investing in facilities incrementally as opposed to what we have already done. So that leverage will start playing out. And uh, we've always talked about EBIT. We've never talked of EBIT as a number. And that's where... Uh, 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 you would start seeing over a period of time some additional leverage onto a bit as the gap over a period of time narrows down. So that part of your observation is uh, right. I would not be able to comment in terms of the extent that you have talked of uh, being 15% uh, percentage. Uh, 
but directionally as we scale up uh, it should uh, uh, it should uh, reduce uh, the second element is that we have also done an acquisition right now so that will again start introducing uh, another intangible charge in our pnl uh, from q2 of this fiscal so that's where uh, uh, you know while the past acquisitions amortizations start tapering off the new acquisitions amortization starts replacing it uh, hence it is much more easier for us to give perspectives on ebitda and that's where we have been talking largely on the ebitda in all our commentaries so uh, before i just give uh, ajay to talk on the on subsequent questions one of the parts on guidance is that is what is our internal uh, the the strategy that we are talking about that we want to hit a phase where we are more predictable and we so we show consistency in our performance so that you are able to uh, uh, you know predict much more reliably as as our uh, growth comes out and uh, it won't be uh, completely uh, basis what the management is talking where will we end but uh, i'll let uh, you know ajay take those two elements uh, as he answers this one over to you ajay yeah yeah so nambi thanks uh, sandeep uh, picking up uh, the second question right so sandeep as i mentioned i think the last time uh, you and i spoke uh, uh, is that from a comp perspective right our comp is for senior leadership position is divided between fixed variable and stocks i think we always had a very compelling uh, comp and benefits package as well as a very compelling structure around fixed variable and stocks uh, that was never a problem with zensar and that was a good practice which we will continue with okay so that is first uh, second uh, so leap to your second question right so what we have seen in this quarter is that the right team is coming together right set of services clients are coming back has generated momentum right in terms of operationalization of strategy we have moved it into gear so we've gone into first gear right over the next few quarters as we step up as we as we go up into the higher gear this strategy will take roots and will anchor and will start driving towards our objective which is to get into a cadence of predictable sustainable growth now i just want to be very clear that this quarter is not because our strategy has kicked in there are green shoots that we have seen as we have gone into the first gear but the true impact of strategy will happen over the course of next 3 to 7 quarters we are one quarter down so sandeep i hope that answers your question no so you know ajay you have uh, answered it uh, quite elaborately but i am still not uh, very much uh, clear what you are trying to say on the recruitment policy and i again don't want anything to know on your strategy part of it but at least what is your thought process like you know if you are seeing a very good industry tailwind going ahead and you know we all know there is the supply chasing demand this is a fact which has been established in last 18 months so in that case the getting manpower itself is very challenging and we are we are facing it every day with every company when we are talking they are telling us the consultants are telling us all the things so how are you going to you know fix this part because you know until unless uh, there is a huge Uh, uh compensation which comes from the esop uh, getting and retaining the top talent will be really challenging because if you if you go the other path of giving high fixed cost and variable component then you you take two risks one is that you know your margins keep on uh, your cogs keep on going going up which puts lot of pressure for the sgna to go down and which may not be good in the long term because then it it, it compromises with your marketing strategy on the other hand uh, if it is a, if it is if it is more coming from the uh, back ended ease of then the benefit is that you know everyone benefits in the journey and everyone is motivated towards that objective so if you can at least you know give some qualitative comment on that it will be of great help because this answer of uh, having great strategy from beginning on the compensation part uh, is something which we all are aware and we respect that but if you can give some qualitative aspect to it that will be really really helpful thanks a lot yeah 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 sandeep sandeep actually 
there is a third question you asked, right? So I will divide your question into two parts. One is, what is our strategy for senior level hires? And what is our strategy for direct contributors, right? Senior level hires, I think we have a very good program in place, a very good comp and benefits plan in place. And, uh, and we continue to attract top talent, right? So the hires that we have done in various businesses, we have actually ended up hiring the top talent in the industry. Your other question is related to the fact that we are in a demand rich, but a supply constrained environment, which means supply is very inelastic, right? And most of that inelasticity of supply is in the area of direct contributors. And a lot of that is in terms of direct contributors in engineering and data engineering skills. That is a completely different bracket, right? And how we address that is how we address overall uh, demand supply equation for our business. And Pramila gave you a view of that a little while back, right? In terms of what we are doing in terms of upskilling, reskilling existing talent, what we are doing doing in terms of increasing engagement, what we are doing in terms of uh, uh, rotations, what we are doing in terms of uh, amplifying our organic engine to bring in new talent. That is a second category, uh, Sandeep. We are focused on making sure that we do the best on both categories. Okay, that's very helpful and thanks and best of luck for the future quarter and a great quarter, honestly. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sandeep. Thank you. Due to the time constraint, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be taking the last question for today, which is from the line of Madhu Babu from Canada HSBC. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi, sir. Congrats on strong graduation. Sir, a while back we were talking of, you know, taking uh, permanent work from home employees. Uh, so how has been the experience with those employees, you know, we are hiring, we have hired from tattoo cities, etc. And incrementally, how do you see the delivery changing post-COVID, even after normalization, how much of your workforce will be on the work from home? And second, on BFSI, we have done one acquisition earlier on the insurance. But to uh, being such a large vertical and we have a, a kind of a smaller presence there. So with the current cash balance, would you like to be be for the BFSI vertical with another acquisition? So these are the two questions. Thanks. Yeah, Madhu, I'll uh, I'll request Vivek uh, to answer your first question and for Pramila to add to it, and then I will come back to answer your second question. So Vivek, do you want to take the work from home and the talent onboarding question? And Pamela, Absolutely. if you can add, please. Absolutely, Ajay. Thanks a lot. Uh, and good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks, Madhu Babu, for the question. Yes, uh, in fact, uh, as all of us know, we have been uh, pioneering in terms of the model of work from anywhere. And that is, uh, is becoming extremely pertinent uh, and relevant in the context of uh, what the situation we are facing in the market right now where every company is finding opportunity to ensure that uh, supply base increases and uh, uh, that supply base fulfills uh, the demand which is there in the market. So for us, uh, to answer your question, it has been a very good experience. Uh, we have been able to engage with our work from anywhere employees very extensively, and it has helped us uh, move into tier two and tier three cities to increase the supply base. So our experience has been extremely good and we are going to further build on this uh, uh, opportunity which we have put together, the initiative we have put in place. Over to you, Pramila, for the second question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Vivek. Just to add to what Vivek mentioned, uh, Madhu, the work from anywhere has been an opportunity for us to tap into new talent pools going beyond uh, the centers where Zensar has been operating in India. So a lot of our talent, both including senior talent as well as fresher talent, now we've, uh, we're looking at onboarding them from all over India. So that has been a big opportunity for us to really strengthen our uh, talent supply uh, channels uh, itself. And uh, so on the uh, work from uh, anywhere model, I mean, we continue to deliver our projects to our customers seamlessly across the globe in the last uh, uh, five to six quarters ever since we've gone to work from uh, gone into this model. 
So uh, we continue to strengthen our, uh, like what Vivek talked about, uh, the engagement with our employees is one thing. Second is we're also strengthening our ability to virtually start projects, win projects, execute them uh, seamlessly. Uh, being a digital company, the investment we've made in digitizing all the delivery process in Zensar over the last few to four years, that's become a big advantage for us to, uh, in this new virtual mode, to continue to deliver a very strong, uh, I mean, projects in a very strong way with process maturity not diluting the rigor at all. So uh, we see that once, I mean, um, the vaccination for the, the second vaccination for most of our employees here in India, once that happens, uh, we will see going back to the office. We don't have the timeline yet. We have not decided that, but it will not be everybody going back to office. We see teams in small numbers going back. We have already identified what are the kind of roles and projects which will be which can be executed in the hybrid mode. So that's, we are waiting and watching how uh, the whole environment uh, unfolds for us. Uh, but uh, this is not really impacted. It's further strengthen our uh, talent supply chain, the whole uh, uh, work from anywhere situation now. Right, right. Thanks, Pramila. And Madhu, if I can answer your second question, which relates to m and So, you know, just to reiterate, strategy, five SGOs, uh, operationalized through 21 playbook, right, which are specific service propositions uh, to our clients, supported by four pillars, sales expansion, talent, M&A, and partnerships. Uh, M&A, all future M&A that we do, including the M3BI acquisition that we, you know, concluded, uh, that, that, you know, we just uh, concluded, we announced the acquisition in Q1, we just concluded it all acquisitions that we do have to support one or more of these stated SGOs. That is the first principle. The second principle that we will go by is that uh, uh, any acquisition that we do has to bring in capability, skills, and market access. Now, just to take M3BI as an example, now while they support mul multiple ver verticals, the dominant play that they have is in financial services. So what they do is they not just augment skills in advanced engineering services and data engineering services, but they also bring to us client access in form of some very, very large clients, uh, very sizable clients in financial services space and a couple of other verticals as well, but dominantly in financial services. And that is the strategy that we look forward to implementing and adhering to as we go forward. Our big focus areas uh, from services perspective, from our SGO perspective, as we look into the next set of acquisitions, uh, as I shared with you in the prior conversations that we had, is advanced engineering services and around SaaS platforms uh, like SFDC, et cetera. So, Madhu, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, so thanks and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be taking a few more questions now. The next question is from the line of Varun Goenka from Nippon India Asset Management Company. Please go ahead. Yes, good morning, everybody, and uh, a good set of numbers and very elaborate uh, answers. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, just one question. I wanted to understand our gross margin. Uh, what could be the drivers of our gross margin, uh, which is actually, uh, I would say, lower than some of our peers at the moment and how that could trend or uh, what could really drive that. Uh, it would also uh, uh, provide better understanding of the value addition that you're doing. Uh, so uh, I just want to understand this uh, line item of yours. Yeah, Varun, I actually request Mamneet to take that question. Mamneet? Sure. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, Varun. Uh, in terms of gross margins, uh, I think uh, uh, we've exited the quarter at 34.8 uh, percentage. I think right. for for a company uh, of our size, and if you will see the the trend of our gross margins in the past, this has been significantly higher levels as compared to the margins that we had been operating at uh, in the past. So to a certain extent, it has gone up. Uh, we definitely see a good amount of uh, headwinds coming in uh, on account of uh, the supply side uh, uh, 
uh, crunch which the industry is going through uh, the wage hikes that we have uh, announced for and uh, while this is the case uh, we are also working on uh, significant levers uh, to improve these margins i think pramila did talk about uh, the pyramid focus that we are uh, giving on uh, that is something which will take uh, some time to really start uh, show up in the uh, the gross margins for us uh, over a period of time as as we are able to move and change the pyramid to much more uh, lower experience people uh, so that the cost benefit starts realizing in in the margins uh, we also are uh, you know cognizantive of the onset of sure mix if you see about say a year or a year and a half back or uh, we had the onset mix of our revenues used to be around uh, 65 to 67 percentage uh, at this moment it's around at 58 percentage uh, so we have already made a good shift in comparison with other companies i think uh, you know these two reasons have always stood out as the reasons why our margins have been uh, slightly the gross margins have been slightly lower uh, both on account of a higher on site mix as well as uh, the the per person cost that we have and uh, in both these areas uh, we have made a decent movement so far uh, but a good chunk of work also has to be done in the pyramid bit uh, which will take uh, some time to deliver on so we don't give any kind of a guidance on a gross margin perspective but we have always reiterated that on an ebitda perspective what is the level that we want to hit in the medium to long term and we are all focused on getting to that as a end result uh, as we work towards how do we uh, improve our gross margins but at this level i think these are these are very uh, high levels uh, which you currently see in the current quarter as well and uh, there would definitely be in the in the short term there will be some moderation which will happen to this levels sure no th- the thanks that's that's uh, very uh, clear uh, so uh, just to just to uh, go a bit deeper on this one on the offshoring mix ballpark directionally will it keep improving in your favor for next several years or uh, how do you see that based on either the clients or your project requirements or h- how do we really understand not the next few quarters but more maybe 3 years down the line how do you see your mix yeah so from a long term perspective we would want to have much more uh, uh, a bit higher uh, offshoring mix uh, yeah. but uh, uh, you know uh, it will still remain range bound till it makes a big shift i think you have already made a quantum shift from uh, the levels we were used to be operating in the past uh, so at this moment for some period it will remain within a range uh, as over a longer term we we still work out how do we get uh, and drive higher offshoring as a as a lever for us okay and uh, like your presentation shows that you added uh, a client so as your deal sizes grow uh, or as your uh, client mining grows will this at least give you additional lever to invest in your sgna or maintain your margins uh, to offset uh, you know the supply side issue or no the uh, you know that is not adding anything incrementally uh, so from the current levels uh i would say it's uh, difficult to say to add further incremental to fuel the opex uh, investments and that's why we have been very clear that in the interim there would be some uh, element of moderation you will see on the margins on account of both of this uh, the supply side issues the wage hikes as well as the continuing investments that we will be making as we have called out uh, right. and uh, you know uh, over a over a long term from an ebitda perspective like i answered in the uh, early, uh, earlier one of the earlier questions as well uh, we maintain that we want to hit and uh, be consistent around a high ten margin uh, which is the ebitda range and that is what all of us are focused on no no really appreciate you guys uh, giving a very realistic picture and uh, moderating our expectations thank you thank you so much Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I hope this is just the beginning. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Varun. Thanks. Appreciate your wishes.
Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nitin Padmanabhan from Investec. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thanks for the follow-up. Uh, uh, just had a quick bookkeeping question. Uh, of the total uh, TCV of wins that we've announced, what is the net new proportion? Yeah, so it would be uh, it would be around 50-50 uh, uh, as net new and 50% uh, as uh, renewals. And the uh, how are the tenures sort of trending for you on the TCV? The TCV tenures have not uh, changed drastically for us. You know, it ranges based on the deals. It can go on from say a three months to a five-year tenure. So that's how uh, it's a, it's a mix of uh, all kinds of deals in the TCV at this moment. Sure. Are shorter term deals uh, a, a bigger, shorter tenure deals a bigger proportion at this point or? Yeah, that's very difficult to comment on offhand. Probably we'll take that offline. Sure. Fair enough, Namit. Uh, thank you so much and all the very best. That's all from my end. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. The next question is from the line of Manik Taneja from JM Financial. Please go ahead. I thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I just wanted to pick your brains on the aspect that uh, everybody in the industry is campaigning to hire fresher talent. And in the past, whenever we have seen this kind of a situation, uh, we've also heard murmurs around the quality of talent. Do you think that becomes uh, some sort of an issue maybe over, over the next four to six quarters time frame? And second question was with regards to the possibility for value-based pricing for both Gensar as well as uh, the industry as a whole, uh, given we we picked up comments from some of your peers about the possibility of uh, some pricing realignment due to supply side pressures. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, Manik. Uh, so Manik, as we know, right? So we are in a situation where supply side of the equation is very inelastic, right? Uh, it's a demand-rich, uh, supply-constrained environment. And uh, one of the biggest, uh, so we, we, and we are, we are addressing this problem using multiple different levers, right? Uh, we are looking at uh, expanding the scope of uh, uh, geographies that we operate out of. We are looking at expanding, uh, you know, we just went through the whole work from home. Uh, already we have people working from 28 cities. So outside of our core uh, development centers in India, in uh, Pune, Hyderabad, Bangalore, we will look to expand outside, right? Uh, in line with whatever we have achieved thus far. Big lever is what we do with fresh talent. Uh, uh, without uh, going into too much detail, we have created a very sharp plan in terms of how we onboard that talent. Uh, that is from a Zensar specific perspective, a very, very sharp plan to uh, activate that talent, to onboard that talent, to make that talent productive. From a macro perspective, industry-wide, uh, uh, Manik, uh, I think uh, I think what we will see is the rebound of effort from firms such as ours to really invest in onboarding that fresh talent. An effort that in the last you know, two or three years had diminished, right? And with the extreme inelasticity that we see developing, that effort is going to rebound, right? Now, as we do that, yes, you know, we have to be careful uh, as to, you know, what we do with quality of that talent. But uh, but also, Manik, you know, we, we, have a, we have a buying community that is much more discerning uh, much more uh, careful about the quality of the talent that is onboarded. And the winners and losers in this space in terms of how you fare with fresh talent is going to be determined in terms of how well and how quickly can you make this talent productive. And we have put a very, very, very strong plan in place. Uh, we are piloting that plan and we'll continue to develop on that over the next several quarters. Thank you. And uh, I had a follow-up question for Navneet. Navneet, you said that the quantum of wage increments 
or the impact of wage increments in Tokyo would be higher than what it was in January or the 4 to FY21 quarter. So uh, that impact was, used, was about 100 bips x of uh, some of the uh, optimization. So should that be the benchmark or should the benchmark be more like 100 to 250 bips, bips impact on margins because of wage increments? Yeah, so I have given you a direction perspective. We are not giving any particular guidance on this. Uh, so uh, we've uh, we still to work out uh, how it will impact on an overall perspective from our Q2 perspective. Uh, but uh, I would uh, I would just uh, uh, reiterate what I have said. Uh, it will be directionally uh, uh, much uh, higher than what you have seen uh, in 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 Q4. Uh, uh, financials the way it had played out. So it will definitely be much higher than that. No, sure. Thank you. Navneet, appreciate that. My only question is, is that 100 bips or the comparison benchmark needs to be higher than 200 bips because that 100 bips also included the benefit of certain cost optimization measures? Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, like we said, the cost optimization measures will take some time to play out. So you should probably uh, assume that the cost optimization impact will come in future quarters uh, not uh, will not Im impact immediately and that's largely on account of the supply side uh, issues which the industry is actually going through sure thank you and all the best for the future yeah. thanks thank you the next question is from the line of general jain from omkara capital please go ahead Yes, thank you for the opportunity. I had a uh, couple of questions regarding how you see the growth going forward and more specifically, what sort of growth do you expect to come from the acquisition that we recently made of the M3BI? And the second part of my question is about the utilization. As, uh, do you see that as a margin lever going forward? And if yes, then how, 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 what levels of utilizations do you hope to achieve? Yeah, so Jinal, I'll take the first question and I'll ask uh, the question of me to take the second. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, as I mentioned, Jinal, the, uh, we feel good about the direction of our business. We put a strategy in place. We have called out that as we operationalize the strategy, that operationalization will happen over several quarters for the impact of that strategy to be felt in terms of achieving our objective, which is to drive predictable, sustainable growth. It will take four to eight quarters and we are one quarter down. So we are not changing that trajectory. What we do see is some early signs of success, which point to the fact that we are headed in the right direction, right? Uh, but in order to achieve a cadence of sustainable, predictable growth for the future, for the whole strategy to play out, to take root, we stick by the, uh, you know, by what we stated when we launched the strategy, which is four to eight quarters and we are one quarter down. Uh, for the second question, I would refer that to Navneet. Yeah, yeah, Umkara. So if you would see our utilization, uh, uh, especially during the pandemic period, had gone up very significantly. And as uh, demand started uh, coming back, uh, we've also uh, done good amount of proactive hiring, which is what you are seeing uh, uh, reflecting in our utilizations currently. Uh, as we have talked of uh, significant initiatives around uh, pyramid optimization, which would mean that we will hire a good amount of uh, fresh engineering graduates. Uh, there will be some impact on utilization as a consequent to that as well. However, that uh, the cost of those will be significantly lower. So incrementally, it should not uh, impact the margins very significantly adversely. Uh, but uh, we believe uh, the utilization levels that we are currently at uh, you know, uh, should remain within a narrow range. This should not move either way very sharply. Uh, and, uh, you know, that is what we have also assumed in when we are talking anything with respect to 
uh, our, our margin expectations from a go-forward perspective. Okay, that's fair enough. And just uh, could you give a number on what sort of growth you expect from the acquisitions and what sort of, uh, are you, will you be still be looking at more acquisitions? Yeah, so with respect to the current one, uh, M3BI, which has been concluded, its numbers yes. will start flowing in from the uh, Q2 uh, of our uh, financial year, which is the July to September quarter. Uh, for calendar year 2020, that uh, transaction, I, I think M3B had reported revenues of over $26.75 million. From those levels, they have gone up uh, a bit and which will start reflecting in our uh, Q2 numbers. From a go-forward perspective, uh, as Ajay has called out, uh, a part of our strategy is to augment the capabilities and build and strengthen the capabilities that we want to in our uh, focused SGOs. And that is something we would be continually looking at. And uh, as and when there is something which makes sense, we'll go ahead and acquire it. As of now, there is no particular uh, perspective as to how much proportion of our growth will come from acquisitions. As and when they start getting added into our numbers, we'll call it out as to what uh, what is the extent of organic. You can look at it uh, versus what is it incrementally which has come uh, from an acquired entity so that you get a much better picture on it. Okay. Thank you. All the best for the future. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Gaurav Koner from Augmenta Research. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, congratulations to the management for a good set of numbers. Uh, most of my answers, uh, questions have been answered. Just wanted to quickly ask about the M3BI acquisition, which is uh, with the top line uh, growth that you will be getting from this. Uh, these numbers being uh, integrated in your results, uh, will these be coming at similar margin levels as the rest of your business? Uh, and a uh, second question I had is, are there any more acquisitions in the pipeline for this financial year? Thank you. Yeah, so uh, uh, Navneet, so, can I just take that question? Yeah, yeah, Navneet, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to comment uh, on, the, on the margin aspect that you've asked of. Uh, so, in terms of uh, M3BI, the revenues will start flowing in. Uh, see, whenever you make an acquisition, there is always initially uh, an impact which comes to your P&L on account of the amortization of intangible assets, uh, which in the initial years tends to be slightly uh, higher than uh, the, the revenue outflow which comes in because the revenue will start flowing, uh, the growth starts flowing in subsequently. So that is some dilution you will start seeing on the uh, EBIT level straight away. Uh, and in terms of margins, uh, m 3 margins, uh, you know, uh, at the time of acquisitions have been uh, slightly lower than Zensa margins. And uh, we will call out, uh, you know, in our uh, next quarter results as to uh, how uh, it has performed differentially. Uh, for you to be able to understand uh, what's the impact on margins on it. Uh, so so that's on the M3BI piece. In terms of future acquisitions, as I called out and uh, Ajay also had elaborated, we are continuously looking for uh, targets in the uh, focus SGOs we have. And as and when we actually come around something meaningful and, uh, you know, get into uh, any kind of... Uh, 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 you know, uh, an SPA uh, uh, or a definitive agreement, we will be announcing that to the market. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, and Gaurav, look, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, any acquisition we do going forward, including the M3BI acquisition that we just concluded, will need to support. We will do an acquisition only if it supports one of or more, one or more of our stated SGOs, number one. Number two is the acquisition needs to bring to us uh, three things, capabilities, skills, and market access. Our approach has been, towards acquisition has been tuck in acquisition to leapfrog capabilities, to bring in skills, and to gain market access. And that overall approach 
is not going to change. We constantly look at acquisition candidates, and if we find one that is of the right value and of the right, uh, uh, you know, uh, fit with our approach and strategy, uh, we will look at it seriously. We constantly evaluate what's out there in the market. Got it. Thank you for the answers, and we wish you all the best for the future endeavors. Yeah. Thanks, Gaurav. Thank you. As there are no further questions, I would now like to hand the conference over to Mr. Ajay Batoria for closing comments. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, thank you, folks. Thanks for uh, attending our call. Thank you for the great questions that you uh, asked us. Uh, I trust and hope that we've given you clear answers and we've uh, uh, given you a sense of uh, you know our business. Uh, look forward to connecting with you on an ongoing basis and uh, wish you all a very good morning. Thanks a lot. Thank you. On behalf of HDFC Securities, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines.